But where was the policy background in this? Um, Homes for Today and Tomorrow came out in 61. Civic Amenities Act was the, the, the great changer. And the Essex countryside, a landscape in decline. Um, Homes for Today and Tomorrow, um, Parker Morris by any other name, um, came out originally as, of course, a planning document. The home in its setting, control of development by town planning, cannot by itself produce good layout and appearance. And actually, um, that was a very strong document that was creating the case for architecture and, and what we now call urban design, architecture and planning, uh, very clearly. Uh, and, and the spatial standards that we now know Parker Morris by began to emerge from that document, but took on a life of their own later. Um, the Civic Amenities Act, meanwhile, was one of the great pieces of legislation which shaped an awful lot of what we deal with now. I mean, one of the things it introduced was conservation areas, and it, it sort of updated listing. There were local lists, but we now had national lists. Um, it was very, very strong on a civic sense, um, if you like. And I think it was one of those great turning points where government is beginning to realize that it can't just do industry, it can't just do basic, so the, the, the social economy, uh, that there is something about civic in there that needs to be addressed. And, and the map, just for the sake of an example, shows the number of listed buildings that eventually came out of it. Uh, but the other document, which I, I've not got an illustration of, that was equally fundamental, was, uh, was a study of the Essex landscape, uh, done locally, done internally, that said, look, there's a landscape in crisis here. The farmers are ripping up the hedges, you know, enlarging the fields. Um, what we take for granted as this gently rolling setting um, actually is in p at the point of not being there. And that combined with the Civic Amenities Act and the growth of civic societies themselves, I don't know when the Civic Trust started, but I suspect it was probably earlier than this, but, but combined as a generator for the Essex Design Guide. In Essex, one had members, um, senior members of the council saying, well, actually, how do we get at this? You know, what do we do? And within the council were people who were beginning to look at it. I mean, one of the first things they did, as I understand it, was they went and hired six architect planners, you know, something that we no longer have in the public sector, hardly. Um, something that we didn't have for very long, actually. Uh, but they recognized that solving these problems involved a degree of skill and change and risk and change to the system of delivery that actually was about very bold thinking. I mean, one looks now at what preoccupies local authorities when they go through reorganization, and it ain't that. Um, so, so, I mean, those are the strands that you know, with echoes of today that, that began to put in place this thinking. There were other strands. Donald Insull's work in Thaxted in 1966 and, and Newport Village Conservation Plan in 1972. I mean, I put those up because on the right, the beginning to get, I mean, go back to Abercrombie's. If you know Aber Abercrombie did a delicious little book on planning. Um, with some lovely illustrations that set out the structure of planning, you know, starting with analysis. Um, and there is a set of drawings that began to get there. But the drawing on the left just reminded me of how difficult it is and how difficult it was even to draw, uh, to get at, to visually comprehend uh, the sort of challenge that we had in extending small towns and villages when there weren't a lot of other things to help us do it. Um, it was actually very difficult. Uh, and, and one of the things I take a lot of comfort from is, in a sense, the crudeness of these drawings. You know, we're so used to seeing magazines and now computerized everything. Uh, and this very highly polished form of presentation. And I think we slightly lose sight of the difficulty of doing this original thinking. And it looks difficult, and it was difficult, and the guys pressed on, you know, and, and again, with a lot of support. Um, the drawing on the left doesn't look like it was going to go around the world as planning guidance. Um, and the first draft came out and was consulted on extensively. Um, and then we got to the document itself in 1973 with that, um, you know, sort of slightly um, 
well, iconic cover, I think, um, and the lovely drawings that, that went with it. I mean, very, very solid analysis, um, but beautifully illustrated. And again, I feel that we tend to downplay the value of illustration. Um, talking to the chief planner the other day, um, he trained in Essex, and we were just talking about the Essex design guide. You know, is it, is it relevant? You know, what this original version, those of us who remember the original version. And, I mean, one of the great strengths was that it was adopted. It was understood by members, by lay people, lay decision makers. It was understood by planners um, with enormous clarity. And although some of this looks terribly simple today, I mean, we're looking, what well, I want to get to is what we do next, how we take it forward. It looks terribly simple. But the more people you talk to, the, the, the real confidence they had that in their locality, this was the first rung in understanding this difficult area of three-dimensional thinking, you know, these difficult characters architects, not always very articulate. Um, it was the first way of getting there, and I still feel its great value is this enormous sense of here is something we can understand, um, don't necessarily agree with, but actually we can take that initial understanding and add today's complexity to it. And I, I think that's an enormous value. The detail of the guide in some ways was, was quite similar to, to the interwar work. I mean, the contents, policy, practice, planning context, physical criteria, visual criteria. I think how nice that they went for visual criteria. Detail. Lots and lots of pages. I've, I've not actually brought a copy with me. And I think one, in my memory, I remember it, remembered it until I went back to it. For the drawings on the right, those lovely courtyards. Um, that when they were added to existing villages, some very fine building came out of this period um, by the private sector, countryside developers had a lot to do with it. I think um, it, it, needs, it needed and it needs good developers who actually understand locality. Uh, but it, it developed into some really lovely, gentle, undemonstrative extensions to villages uh, that when you drive past them now, match the quality of the original village. They've aged well. The materials are good. I mean, the garden test, you know, people are liking living there. But again, the key issue in terms of the importance of the document was that the team worked with the highways team within the county and began to get at highway standards, which actually were doing the damage for most of the estates. Uh, prairie planning, uh, the, the stuff Ian Nairn and the architecture review was going on about. The stuff that we still have difficulties with, actually. Um, housing, it always strikes me, is much more today about car parking. Uh, one probably should say about the spaces in between, and, but actually the spaces in between are often filled by car parking. We'll come back to that one. Uh, but here's housing at Note Bridge in Basildon. I, th I think probably the finest example of um, Essex Design Guide coming out. Um, and the, uh, the Muse Court, again, the drawing, the way it's been translated. I mean, very easy to get quite picky about this, to get quite architecturally snobbish about something that, uh, you know, goes back to render, is gentle, isn't making grand statements. But actually, that is its strength. It really is. Uh, and when there is time spent, and, and again, I think one of the other r values of this document across a huge area was that by having it, it implied that you had people who understood, understood it. And actually, it implied that you had architects and people prepared to take time to get it right. And you had committees who were prepared to take time to get it right. Uh, and I think these sort of, if you like, almost invisible assets are things that we tend to lose sight of today. Um, the influence of the guide. Well, I think there are a number of influences, and almost one is tempted to say that the guide itself is the least important thing in a way. Um, for me, I think the great influence was on roads. And in 1977, residential roads and footpaths came out, which actually reordered narrow streets were allowable. You know, you could do away with, with footpaths. I, I put the little drawing at the top there, um, which is actually Runcorn. And um, 
I've just forgotten the name of this, the estate now, but it was, I mean, Runcorn actually influenced this as much as Essex, one ought to say, and the Cheshire Design Guide and road standards were coming out at the same time. There were very healthily competing strands in terms of the way this developed. But the fact that this got into roads and, and the roads documents, I mean, I think one of the greatest urban design documents is, is the current road guidance. I mean, you know, the Langham Baxter's practice and others fed into um, urban design as, as managed by highway engineers and others. And, and this made that link um, in, in contemporary times. Uh, the other guidance, of course, is, uh, is pure Essex design guide. And it's gone around the world. I mean, it's, it's part of every planning course, I think, anywhere now. Um, we, uh, this is it in, in Japanese. We've, we've had two, my desk has had two requests for copyright to translate it, one into Chinese and one into Turkish. So I'm beginning to wonder um, quite the relevance sometimes. And, and one of the disadvantages, of course, is that the building industry rubber stamped this all over the rest of the country and immediately devalued the thinking. Uh, but that said, um, it provided a baseline. Um, just examples now of how it built South Wooden Ferrers. Um, another very nice example, small new town, scale of new ash green, and indeed, when you look at the town centre, the drawing's not terribly clear. I mean, a, a, a town centre which has, has got that idiosyncratic shape uh, that, that, that came out of, of New Ash Green. But again, it's, it was doing something that, again, we've forgotten how to do, which was to create single focus settlements uh, with shops, um, with the social services, uh, with landscape, with playing fields, with the, all of that stuff that actually makes... Uh, areas civilized and now we have you know enormous difficulty in doing doing new settlements and an absolute muddle out there at the minute uh, but also somehow the public realm the public purse is has backed off funding that bit of stuff that makes these settlements civic uh, that, that makes them urbane that makes them humane um, 1997, the guide went on, very much the same, actually. The drawings got a little bit rationalised and uh, new leg legislation came in. Um, it established best practice. I mean, by 1997, there were schemes to look at, which is always immensely helpful. Um, was advocating mixed use. I think one must remember that the private sector at this time was gradually taking over from the public sector as the provider of housing. And certainly over great swathes of rural Essex, it always would be that way round, um, new highway standards, and gradually the density issues were beginning to be looked at. I, I, I mean, density was looked at. Um, some of you might correct me in this in the earlier versions, um, but I'm not sure that it was really seriously an issue. We were dealing with low density, and I remember all of us looking with quite detail at tiny variations, but actually it was all low density. Um, and depending on where you did the boundary too. Um, two or three years ago, the, the guide was brought up to date, and I've actually brought a couple of copies with me. Um, that's currently what it looks like. Um, that's the guide and, and the Urban Place Supplement. I mean, you can see from the volume of these documents that um, there's quite a lot to take on board. Um, the, the original guide has, has stayed with its um, last, if you like, uh, um, the Urban Place Supplement recognises that really we need to address density now very differently. Um, the numbers suggest that we absolutely have to find, could I suggest a new form of housing? I mean, again, when one looks back to the 19th century, uh, one had the stockbroker houses, we, one had the great middle class suburbs. Uh, we had the very poor inner city areas, which we by and large demolished, the proper back-to-backs. But we also had that range of terraced houses uh, that took, you know, the way we socially broke people down into middle class, lower middle class, all of that stuff that's so very English. But we also housed them in a range of housing that was immensely flexible uh, and, and now survives quite well, but is noticeably lacking, I feel, in, in, in areas actually like Essex. So, urban place supplement, three strands, building in context, I'm going to go through these quickly because you really know all this and it's, it's about the structure of, of design guidance uh, rather than the detail. Quality of design, investment in the public realm, uh, new street types, street safety, 
building design, uh, the, the shift in emphasis really is to street planning, or the, the shift back in emphasis is to street planning, and of course this issue of sustainable development, um, which see, strikes me as probably the, equivalent, the 19th century equivalent of sustainable de development was electricity. And, and when, you, when you go back and look at how planning had to cope with the gradual electrification of cities, um, we had to create planning methodologies, but we had to understand electricity and then the technology changed. It opened up lots and lots of new avenues. And what became a very simplistic cable laying exercise was absorbed into something else. And for me, sustainable thinking is doing the same. We've all got tangled up with definitions. Where I believe we're at is not kit, but cleverer thinking. And where we need to go is to absorb that sense of direction, that sense of clarity about future communities that also are careful on their use of energy and materials, uh, but don't go off down a route of singularly looking at kit. I mean, this has got to bring itself back to place and space and community. So the guide in 2005, key changes, planning context. I think we've done this really, haven't we? Um, let me move on. Um, a criteria for densities below 20. I mean, just simply to put up a photograph, I mean, in my head, I can see the drawing at the beginning of this sequence, you know, lovely boulevards, tree planting. Um, when do we do that now? Um, why not? If you actually analyse the use of space and the density, I'm totally unconvinced that it's not possible to do that. Uh, the form might be different, uh, but we just seem to have uh, costed out anything uh, that you can't sell immediately. Uh, and that generosity of space, which is about something English, you know, is about Essex, is about um, a, a sort of freedom of movement, it really needs to be looked at again. Um, understanding the context, I mean, again, where we're at now with guidance in general, I was feeding recently into um, the current document, um, World Class Spaces, I think, that came out in May. Um, and that is very strong on its diagrams and how it's interdepartmental and how we do the thinking. Not to put that to one side. That is where government thinking is at, but it's very interesting that it has to put it out in management diagrams rather than doing as Essex did and going and hiring a few people who knew what they were doing. And I, I think we make life complicated for ourselves sometimes. Um, I mean, if one is going to be slightly critical about design guidance, because there is a huge, overwhelming volume of it at the moment. I mean, I understand the Homes and Communities Agency are also looking at all of this. We have CABE, whom I absolutely support. It's meant to be positive. Let me be very, very clear. But in terms of somebody out there as a planner, you know, working in Billericay or wherever, um, this overwhelming good intention is actually rather difficult to manage. Um, and somehow we've downgraded planning, we've downgraded planners. Um, no longer do you have the planner sitting at the top table actually voicing these issues. It seems we're getting into the stage where we have to do it in diagrams. And I'm very concerned um, by some of that. Um, this is a little bit of the current presentation that we give when we go round. I mean, this is also about the Essex Design Initiative, which is, which is where we're at now. And the Essex Design Initiative is beginning to look at planning, uh, bearing in mind this issue of guidance, planning as process. How do you help people take decisions uh, and get there? So there, there's a training element. Uh, there's a support element. Um, but let me stay with principles of uh, sustainability. Um, public transport. I mean, I think as you begin to see the list here, uh, one has gone from that very simple document, that very confident document that we were dealing with housing, to a recognition that we're dealing with something much more complex. But actually, we've lost the clarity of how to do it. And we're sort of suddenly having to recreate in very long lists and structured diagrams what it takes uh, to rebuild a sort of a dense and workable urban area permeability. I mean, the language we use, too. Um, Cave, at one point, were rationalising their language down, I thought, 
yeah, the urban design academics will correct me, but I, I thought down to about six words, permeability being one of them, that was quite good about working through, accessing, um, not easily understood by someone who hadn't gone through an urban design course, uh, but by sheer repetition, the language was getting out there, but, but, but that seems to have gone. Uh, a lot of this is about communication. And again, the great strength of that original guide was that it brought with it the lay members. It brought with it the development industry. Shouting and fighting at first, they opposed it, actually. Uh, but they came round. They were challenged in public inquiries. And they began gradually to see the point of it. But it also brought with it the community. And I think it's still noticeable uh, that we get emails now from local groups who will refer to the Essex Design Guide when they're critiquing a local plan. And certainly the parish councils absolutely use it and absolutely understand it. So this issue of communication is very, very important. Um, <coughs> zones, parking solutions, play streets. I mean, this is the current agenda, isn't it? Uh, where we tend to knock off one by one current areas of concern. Uh, and this is the model that came out and characterized Urban Place Supplement and we used for a series of exhibitions. Um, not always liked, curiously. Um, very hard for lay members of the public to understand what that was about. I think it's very interesting when you go and have a look at uh, um, Accordia in Cambridge. <laughs> Funny enough, I think there's a, something of that in Accordia and Accordia grew out. There are links back to the Essex Design Guide. Tenuous, but, but there, but I think it is buildable in, 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 in so many ways. Here today, um, a development that has taken Essex Design Guide, which is the, where I really want to get to, is how do you take it and perhaps lose a little bit of that skin of uh, history? Not always, but occasionally. Uh, and here Proctor Matthews, I think, have done a terrific job at Abode in Newhall. Um, in putting together a very interesting scheme. The, the, the master planners there assure us that Essex Design Guide was part of it. I mean, again, one can be a little critical of some of the streets, but by and large, there's a development there that is working at making a contemporary place. Um, and it reminds me of a trip I made in Architecture Centre days with a community group, a, a, head, a school, and the, the, the older members of the bus were in the front and they, they voted on Abode and Newhall and the older generation hated it without exception. Their children, the younger generation in the back, loved it without exception. And it was just one of those very noticeable things here. Back to that statistic about an aging population, aging decision makers, and this issue of how one freshens up and challenges actually goes forward in a creative way from some of these things. But here's Mel Dunbar when I spoke to him, um, I think at the beginning of this year. Um, he always said it was only one approach. Uh, it was a starting point, it was an image, it was a brilliant piece of work. Um, and they were promoting it at the beginning of another recession, which was in passing. Let me go off into another area quickly. Um, Bleshy, archaeology. Um, what's, I mean, one of the, I mean, so what came out of the Essex Design Guide was highway guidance. Uh, but one of the other great things was that the county got behind both archaeology, uh, enhanced the archaeological team, which after all is saving our, our history and continuity of culture. Um, but it also got behind the landscape and started listing country lanes for biodiversity. I mean, a hugely advanced piece of work for 73, you know, replanting a quarter of a million trees. I mean, that program still exists in its current form, you know, to put back the hedgerows. Um, but the point was that we're focusing on a design guide, which itself was very influential. But decision makers had this ability to think across shaping a county and shaping a sub-region in a physical way, in three-dimensional, four-dimensional planning terms. Um, the archaeology team is now doing some very interesting work on characterization. Uh, and what this is saying is, well, you know, if we're going to be thinking about building into the future and putting all this concrete down, shouldn't we really be putting as much effort into what we've got uh, and certainly into the green environment? And how do we therefore put up guidance on what we've got? And it's one thing having a listed building or a scheduled monument, uh, but actually how do you deal with that across a sub-region? And I'm going to do this almost too quickly, but I mean, 
the, the, the three areas here, archaeology, built heritage, and landscape, together create historic environmental character. And characterization of the historic environment is to ensure that it's given proper consideration. And this is not on a case-by-case -case basis, but where you've got strands of history, rather as, you know, the, the analogy is rows of trees. How do you begin to deal with that in its totality as well as in its individual detail? Uh, and, and to cut very quickly, uh, you begin to map it. Um, you know, contemporary mapping is a, is a brilliant thing, and, and here's some, some of the outputs that come out from some very, very detailed analysis of landscape, quality, objects, objects found, different periods. You begin to create planning patterns of sensitivity, which I think begins to put this on a scale that contemporary planners can work around and work with. And even more, it begins to become stimulating. Um, the landscape team, again, um, again, I mean, you know, what one saw was a county that created these very, very big teams. I mean, my own built environment team still has 25 people in it. There isn't another county, I don't think, with that many people, with the exception of Hampshire. You know, there's a landscape team. There's a very strong planning team. The, the absolute strength of understanding of this document was that at member level they had the, uh, the courage to support the funding of people who would continue to do the work. Because I don't think if it doesn't happen in the public sector, I'm not sure where it goes. And again, we're at one of those turning points where we seem to be losing so many skills from what we call the public sector that it's, it's, it's difficult to retrieve it. The drawing, I don't think, needs explaining. It, it, it's self-explanatory. Um, but there's another issue, isn't there, about 21st landscape. Uh, and Beth Chatter, that great garden writer, has got a garden. Actually, it's a dry garden. <laughs> the photographs are the wet bit. But, but in fact, it's about dry plants. But within, within contemporary Essex, is someone who is uh, experimenting at a hands-on level with what could happen to the landscape and where change is going. And I think that looking over the horizon is very, very critical. Uh, and then again, uh, there's the ability to start doing landscape linking. Um, I mean, we're going to get into sustainability, but uh, how do you manage air quality? Whenever I go to Germany, I'm always impressed by their environmental planners. They have people planning air movement. I remember in Berlin, you know, planning uh, the context of the landscape, not the built environment. And, and there is a team here that has that potential. Green grid work, of course, ongoing across the country, particularly strong in Kent, actually, uh, but also in, 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 in Essex. And again, the mechanism here in shaping the landscape is that it's engaging groups like Groundwork and engaging other decision makers like farmers who were brought in again under that original Essex design initiative to understand how they could start replanting their ground. So, challenges, where are we? Great challenge, the gateway, and, and, and this intermediate land. Um, and the Essex Design Initiative, as I was saying, is looking not just at guidance, but how does one bring this process together, bring the decision makers together, promote, engage people in getting into the detail in a way they can feel confident with and support and help become more radical. Uh, and so there's a training on. Um, there's a support arm, there's a consultancy arm. Um, the issue about Essex Design Initiative is that it's owned by the Essex Planning Officers Association. And if that sounds drab and dreary, it's actually rather important. It's not the county imposing something. It's actually the local planners owning it. And, and these documents now are published by the Essex Design Initiative, which means it is owned by the planning community and these different districts uh, that have come up and, and made county planning so complex. Um, thinking still going ahead, this draft came out earlier in the year and has been quite well covered and are also quite well criticised. What it's saying is, with a bit of very clear thinking, yes, we want to reduce travel by car, yes, we want to reduce the impact of parking, but actually, the way we're doing it is making a huge mess of the estates that we're building. What we've got at the moment isn't working. And, and there are more photographs, possibly better chosen. Um, but, I mean, you can just see, you know, the, the odd garages that are built no longer fit our cars. 
I mean, these narrow streets, which are very nice, are totally parked up. Um, what? There is a lack of common sense. There is too much politically correct thinking around this area at the moment. What we're saying is actually, guys, this isn't anti-green. It's not about Essex Fords dominating the landscape. It's break up the thinking. What's the issue here? Is it managing a, an attractive built environment? And is it managing cars and all of that? But don't confuse the two. Have, you know, begin to separate, uh, begin to move forward. And again, we could pick that up later. Thames Gateway, a lot of issues, I'll, I'll skip that. But it was by way, I mean, just coming back to my previous life at the, the Architecture Centre. Uh, some of the schemes, just a couple of schemes here that I left behind. Um, but it was about the same sort of philosophy, or not a philosophy, approach really. That um, design needs to get back into these areas that it's abandoned. Uh, this we were approached by um, the company London Array wanting to do the biggest wind farm in the country. And for various reasons it came off Essex and it came ashore in Kent. And these things might look elegant in a distance, but they come ashore into things that look like very big, very ugly substations. And this was in an area of uh, special, you know, triple SI area uh, being dealt with by a tiny local council that had never dealt with anything like this. And so we came in and, and, and actually talked to London Array who were commissioning this and said, look, guys, um, what you need is somebody to design your substation. Uh, if you're going to, because it might have been lost at appeal, but the feeling, you know, the, the more complexity, let me keep the story simple. But, you know, you need somebody to look at the design of the substation, to look at the landscape. We're probably not going to fight this off. It is important. How do you make an intervention that fits? And actually, we run an archi a limited architectural competition. Three practices who spent a lot of time getting to know all about electricity substations. And actually, there are three different components in there. Huge detail. Uh, but you can see from the winning scheme that a good designer was able to get at the problem and rationalize it, reconstruct the hill to hide it. Uh, the landscape team came in with this great wave of planting. You know, really rather a lovely intervention. Not necessarily liked in some ways. The landscape was quite scrubby. I mean, you, there's a debate in here. But the understanding is that one needs to attack and get at some of these issues and start using designers with this much broader perspective of shaping a sub-region. Uh, and they built a, a viewing platform to look out across at somebody else's <laughs> a wind generator, as a matter of fact, but it still made the point. Um, the other scheme, just quickly, was, uh, I think you, you, you can read the story, was, was getting designers looking at bridge infrastructure. Um, you know, the members in this case said that they wanted a sense of place. Um, how do you begin to break down engineering so that it is creative, we can have fun with it, it's memorable. And let me just try and bring this a bit more quickly through. Um, the current position is that we've launched something called a best practice, the, the Essex Exemplar Programme, a best practice charter. Sadly, at the beginning of a recession, that's almost taken away any housing that it was meant to be with. But this was a very simple thing that said, well, look, we've got the guidance. The guidance isn't actually having an impact. What is it? Where is it going wrong? Uh, there's nothing new here, but people aren't doing it. Project inception, you know, where is the brief? Most schemes arrive without briefs. You know, they, they're backfilled um, with something to create a planning application. Uh, where's the management of the design process? Um, that doesn't happen. We set up design review. Uh, we're working with Ben, who chairs the Eastern Region Review. We've set up a, a, a county review um, because, again, the system that exists wasn't actually getting into the decision makers who are taking the decisions at district level. Um, we've done a lot of skill development. The first design review we did, we invited members to look at it, to watch. We invited the planning department as observers. So the whole of this issue of how you actually get at design discussions becomes something that people can share in. Um, the rest, I think, you can see where we're coming from. Um, a couple of very quick examples which I'm going to go through is one of the other things that we're finding um, while we begin to think about what a new guide should be is that the planning process has got so totally complex 
that it's actually rather difficult to work with if you're an architect planner. Um, and we are being brought into a lot of schemes where um, Brentwood, which perhaps I'll, is, I'll, I'll, we're doing it in print, which I'll, I'll pick up, um, but Harlow is, 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 is the first example, where the system just isn't able to act. Different agencies, planners with limited means, different landowners, you know, uh, there's Gibbard's view of Harlow, the, the seven areas, there's the railway station, the gateway to the town, a listed building, believe it or not, grade two, and there's the listing photograph, there's the horrid reality it is now. Um, you know, and this gateway um, just isn't working. That first photograph showed the degree of concrete mess there. Now, you would have thought that it was highway, it was station, and there were some very simple things. But actually, the system was not able to cope. And what the team has been doing, again, having a team that can begin to engage in this, is say, well, actually, there's some simple decision-making. There's some simple movement patterns. You can get it. You know, one of the key things that there's a, um, there's a new town, North Harlow, which is, I think, was being opposed by Hertfordshire. There's a triple SI, a river next to the station, station half a mile away from a failing town centre. You know, the complexity was overwhelming the system to a point of stasis. Uh, and we just unpicked it as, as a neutral body. I think, again, the, the role of the Essex Design Initiative is that we're neutral. We're of the public sector. You're not committing big money to the private sector yet. You might need to. But you can unpack a problem. And we did this in front of the members, the civic groups. And we said, look, there are things here you won't like. Um, I mean, here was a set of examples about how you might do a station forecourt. You know, there are things here you might not like. Car parks in green belts, you know, density of development. Um, but actually, guys, you've got to start talking about it. If North Harlow goes ahead, this isn't the edge of nowhere. It's actually the centre of a very major conurbation next to a motorway on a mainline railway. I mean, if we're really going to talk about eco-towns, this isn't one, uh, but actually has all the elements that could create one. And yet that complexity was stopping people get at it. And one of the things that struck me following that presentation was that no one went to the press. Um, because, you know, the, the guys didn't like some of this, of course. You know, and we, we talked about how you, you manage a triple SI in a, a rather lovely river that accepts the fact that it's going to be a lovely, a lovely river in a more urban area. And, and so what the design initiative is about is beginning to get at uh, opening up the discussion, but doing it visually. This is what, you know, it's not a great terribly complex problem. There are one or two simple moves you can take. And I think once you begin to put that to decision makers, it's much easier for people to break the decision making down and go forward. And then uh, to do it with enthusiasm that begins to get you the good architecture and place making that you need. You know, the landowners. Uh, this is uh, Colin at the back there. Put, I think put this one together. And you know, this was one of the schemes that came out. Simply, you know, the landowners had to get together here. The space was big enough to take a small university. The man from the university was sitting in the meeting happily, and he agreed. Um, another example of, of what we're doing is, is Brentwood, and, and very quickly again, lovely town at once upon a time, pretty awful now, highway engineering going through, and we were talking about the problems of consultation, of reworking a highway in a busy street. And, the team pointed out to the leader of the council, actually, guys, you're putting this very expensive road surface in, you know, the shops and the surroundings are an absolute mess. This isn't going to do it for you. What, what are you doing with the rest? And out of that began to put forward something we called a vision document because the planners were unable to get at this because the local plan was going to the inspector. The system wouldn't allow you to put in, you know, supplementary planning guidance, local action plans, the timing wasn't right. And we talked to the members about what you could do, and the leader turned around and he said, well, actually, yes, you know, uh, <laughs> we want to do this. We've been trying to do it. Tell us how we do it. And very interesting, I think, at the moment, in terms of planning. A lot of what we're doing is a fix for a planning system that isn't particularly working. One of the fix here, of course, was to 
suggest they set up Brentwood Renaissance. This is about management taking the decision making outside some of the planning. I, I'll put this more cautiously, more carefully, with a bit more time. Let me not do it too crudely. This is not a down on planning, it's a down on the system. But bringing in Sir Alan Cherry, actually, of Countryside, who works out of there to chair it, um, you know, having some good, robust urban design discussions about. Uh, this, of course, is Belf, uh, Dublin, about you know, some of the things you might do if the land was available. Talking to business, because it's not just about physical planning, is it? Um, community engagement, um, you know, lots of examples. None of it in itself innovative, actually. Very, very straightforward. Lots of research already. You know, took them on visits to Saffron Walden, where there's a really dynamic manager who knows how to animate the town. And what we said was, and I won't go back to the original drawing, but it's not a single strip of a high street. Actually, it's a town that you've got to animate. And you've got to start getting planning back, you know, to, to that sense of envisioning in three dimensions what is happening. And we've got to the point where landowners, the, the public landowners, are putting land up for redevelopment through this committee. Alan suggesting it should be an architectural competition once the market picks up. They're suddenly realizing it's a conservation area. They have buildings of real quality. You know, there's opportunities for squares. It's getting back to the basis of city building. You know, lots of examples of how to do the detail. And that's the site. The top bit is the site that's going to be demolished and changed. So the stuff isn't in itself original. But what we're finding is that we're having to do it in, in document form. And lots of these are being produced. And this, this exercise came out in seven <laughs> part publications. Um, because the decision-making process can't always have planners or ourselves in it. And it's very clear that people actually positively want to get at it. But they need to take something away to their own discussions. And they need to have it accurately. So what we're finding is that the discipline of the built environment team putting it into print means that we have to be clear enough in what we're suggesting to articulate it in print. And, and you leave behind something that isn't a planning. We carefully avoid any planning terminology. Not a planning document. It's about how you shape your town, how you shape your environment. Um, and this exercise is underway. Local authorities committed £100,000. Difficult press, but a lot of community support. Um, so let me begin to bring this to a conclusion, really, because I've been going, I think, for, for, for long enough now and would very much like to open it up. Where we're going now is, is where next, I think. Um, what are the strands that come into the future of design guidance? I mean, what government are talking about, what the political parties are talking about, what government is looking to organise is, is something about local delivery, um, you know, and, and what is localism? Um, well, is localism the Homes and Communities Agency coming and working in your local area. I'm not sure that it is, actually. Uh, local delivery for me is back to this sense of having the enabling, the skills, the drive locally to understand the local context, to manage it and to articulate it forward. Yes, of course, in partnership, of course, in amongst everything else. But actually, it's a lot about skills. Um, and local authorities are key enablers. So that's one set of issues. I think there's a, uh, and you, you get a sense of the proactivity of this. There's another set of issues which is about this discussion of sustainability. Uh, the, the low carbon economy is, 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 is going to be the driver, I believe. Um, there are a lot of very serious issues to do with water, which we're only just beginning to understand. Tree planting, um, managing that, um, but it's not about kit. It's how you begin to engage with something in the future that might not look like the design guides we've got because we've already got that being done by national bodies even now. And I'm not sure that it would be productive, but this is uncertainty to redo that. Um, that initial clarity of the guide is in some ways still there. It's about landscape. It's about the opposite of built environment. I mean, planning for the last two decades has been dominated by cities. It's become urban development corporations, urban planning, you know, uh, the, the urban renaissance. 
most of the Essex councillors are not in cities, you know, and actually most of the Kent, the Surrey, the Hampshire councillors would say the same thing. They don't have the resources the cities have, they don't have the funding. Doesn't mean to say they're not committed to the issues. Uh, but what it needs is a language that begins to get at those issues. And I'm not sure the language can any more be as simple as that original Essex design guide in format or in form or in is it illustration. But it's got to have that simplicity of purpose. Um, as I say, generic guides are there. We're going to be adopting stock, I mean adapting stock. I mean 80% of what we're dealing with in 2020, 2030 is already here. And again, we're talking about planning new spaces and putting much less effort into the sort of exercise in Brentwood, which is actually reshaping a town on pretty limited resources. Um, the local council put in 100,000, which is a good headline figure, but isn't in the way of things a long way. What it will do is trigger, up, trigger other involvement. But it's that engagement with very limited financial resources, getting not just the key decision makers, but your local decision makers to share the sense of direction so that they take their own, de own decisions with confidence in a way that builds towards something bigger. I mean, I think that's where we're at. What does it begin to look like? Well, I mean, there's a bit of thinking here about architectural codes, urban design codes and master plans. I'll cut that out. Um, probably um, here, and Laura Nicolau um, did some work on this, is where design codes and development briefs and regional design guides fit in a planning system that seems to have lost sight of the visual. Um, so on that note, I think I'm going to bring it to a conclusion and invite questions. I think what is the shape? I mean, what are the issues for future guidance? Should we abandon where we are? Is that just too casual, too easy? Is it actually worth reworking that? And certainly that ought to be it. But is there something else that we need to start getting at? You know, and I was very encouraged by those very early crude drawings that generated the Essex Design Guide because I don't think any of us have really got a very clear idea of what we're talking about at the moment. I can say that. And certainly not a terribly clear idea of what the output is. Um, but one of the things we're learning is that although there's an enormous amount of stuff on the web and it is very helpful that there is something very simple still about doing it in printed forms and in a printed way that, that again engages in a different way. So let me stop there and invite questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>